It's uh, nice to have you here. The last time I preached, I was looking down the barrel of just a camera, so it's nice to have some more people. Uh, I'm Stephen Collum, the youth and young adults pastor here that gets to, to serve, and uh, I've been given the privilege of opening up our time uh, in James, and we've titled this series Living Faith. Now, if you've been with us, you're aware that uh, in Genesis, we looked at the faith of Abraham. Uh, and how we are attached to the faith of Abraham. And now we move into James to look at the very practical and real ways that we can live out this faith. That's one of the main focuses in James, is actually how do we live by faith here in the day-to-day livings in this world. A life of faith should be and will be noticeably different to that around us. The farm that I uh, grew up on, uh, back at home we had this huge mulberry tree out the back on the back lawn and I would dare say it was the most beautiful mulberry tree that I've ever seen in my entire life. It kind of made all other mulberry trees ashamed to be alive because of how grand this one mulberry tree was that I had. It had big beautiful branches, had big beautiful leaves, it had shade that could cast out for ages and you could sit under it and it was just an enjoyable tree to gaze at. And when Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God, he talked about this tree that would go on to surpass all others. It would be this beautiful thing. And likewise, the seed of God's word planted into the hearts of Christians is this growing things and it's producing the fruits of the kingdom. And the life that we live by faith is noticeably different and it's this beautiful thing. And especially in times of trouble, as James is about to get into, faith is grown and it's exercised in these times. And it's either living, and the caution James puts up, it can be dying. Jesus would say in the parable of the sower, that God's word is is given out, there's rocky soil, and this is a picture of someone who receives the word of God with great joy. They receive the word of God. But when the times of troubles and trials come, It's not nourished, it's not provided, it falls away, it's too hard to persevere in the time. And so the person loses the faith. James, like Jesus, he knows that trials in this world, they're inevitable, they will come. Faith is going to be tested, some will grow and some will pass. And I really want to give you this imagery of faith as a tree being growing Because faith is growing and maturing in a relationship with Jesus. Faith is not merely a set of doctrinal beliefs. Faith is life lived out according to the belief that we have in Christ. And it's fundamental that we understand that before we move into the passage, that faith is a life lived out according to the Word of God. It's not just saying, I believe in something, and there is no bearing out in that. It's the whole of the life. And so if there's an imagery of a tree that you should have in mind as we talk about faith, it's the tree that was read in Psalms 1 that we had this morning on the reflection passage. It's a tree that is planted in the Word of God, that's its origin. It's sustained by the Word of God, that's where it's nourished. And it produces fruits according to it. This tree is good. Faithful Christians are like this. Faith birthed from the Word of God, nourished by the Word of God, and lived out according to the Word of God. So when you hear me say faith, I'm talking about the belief in God's Word and the belief that is worked out through the life. This morning's message is about the reality, again, that faithful Christians are not at home in this world. Faith will have to endure trials and temptations, and the call is to persevere, and to persevere we need wisdom. And so please hear me when I say James is not giving you a lifestyle tip on how to live the Instagram hashtag blessed life. He is giving you practical ways to live out your faith so that you might endure. He sees this as eternal life. He's trying to show you how to live. And so we start our times in James. Before we begin, I'd like to pray and ask for God's wisdom. Heavenly Father, what we need most is to hear from you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray as we spend our time today in James that we would hear from you. Lord, that we would grow and be nourished. Father, that we would produce by faith things that are pleasing to you in this life. Father, help us in all that we do. In your name, amen. 
If you've kind of ever been uh, wowed by Scripture when it says, hey, be hospitable because you may be entertaining angels. I can only imagine what James must have found out when he found that Jesus, he was entertaining God in his household. James is the, the brother of Jesus, or the, should I say, the uh, stepbrother of Jesus. He was not a believer of Jesus in his ministry that came after the resurrection and after which time he actually became quite a prominent leader in the church, in the early church. The Jerusalem church fell under persecution, troubles and, and trials. And as they dispersed, James wrote to them as a good pastor does. You know, if you remember, you remember Stephen being stoned and, and in Acts it would say they had to leave. Everyone kind of dispersed. Only the 12 apostles really remained. And so they're not in their homeland anymore. And that aligns with the beginning where it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. I was Googling a few weeks ago all the different religions uh, that have got quite a long history to them. And what was interesting is when I got to Christianity, it said, oh, Christianity is around 2,000 years old. But we know from being in our time in Genesis that actually Christianity dates back to the faith of Abraham. Church, you need to know that your faith is as old as Abraham. You are grafted in to what God is doing through his people Israel. You are grafted into Abraham. It's not 2,000 years old. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that God had been doing from the beginning. It goes back to its origins. And you need to know that because you are grafted into the 12 tribes. And so as much as James is giving this message out, so he is giving it out to you today. You may not be in a foreign country to the one that you grew up in, but you are by faith a part of the family of God and you are living in this world which is not your home. You're going to feel like a foreigner here and that's actually quite normal. So just as James writes this letter for them, he writes it for us today, how to practically live by faith here in this world. Just so you know how I'm going to move through this, it's going to go from verses 2 to 4. James is going to give us like a survival kit, I guess, how to persevere in the faith here. He'll go from 2 to 4. And so in 2 to 4, we're going to look at faith needs to become mature. You have to grow up. In 5 to 8, you're going to need to know God's wisdom, how to have God's wisdom to live by faith in each predicament as it comes along. And then in 9 to 12, you really need to be able to distinguish what true blessedness looks like. We don't want to get caught up calling blessed what God calls cursed and cursed what God would call blessed. And so if you want to receive the crown of life or not live this life in vain, then we need to mature in our faith and learn to grow. Paul would say the righteous will live by faith. In verse 2 to 4, James says, Consider it a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you might be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. The story of Christianity, I think I've said that before up here, it's not if you'll go through trials, you will go through trials. You are going to face trials for the faith that you have. Jesus says, in this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome it. In other words, you will face problems specifically for believing in me, but have faith. For by faith you'll be victorious as I am. So G, uh, James's concern is what are you going to do when it happens? How are you going to respond? Ultimately, we have two options. You can grow in your faith through the trial and come out more faithful and more mature, becoming more Christ-like into his image. Or you can shrink, not remain the same. You can hide it under a bowl and be less mature and comfortable in the world. And James would say, consider, consider in the trial, what is your true joy? You're going to have to weigh up. What is your true joy? Is it just to be comfortable? And therefore, you're going to happily sacrifice faith on the altar just to remain? Or is your true joy faithfulness to God? And therefore, you're happy to persevere in the trial, knowing that God is at work in you through it. And that's something we all have to weigh up. It's something that we all have to consider. What do I believe is my highest joy? Faithfulness to my God or comfort in the world? Do I stand in my faith 
or do I go along with the crowd? Do I stand in my faith? Or am I here just to make friends and be comfortable with things around me? Do I stand in my faith or do I speak up against issues? Do I live by faith or am I just living for myself? If we are not living by faith because we fear being uncomfortable, ostracized, or hated, James says, please consider what your highest heights of joy are. Is it faithfulness to God or comfort in the world? Now, this doesn't mean just put on a big fake grin and pretend it's okay. Yay, since becoming a Christian, half my family won't talk to me. Yes, all my friends think I'm a weirdo now. Oh, this, is, this, is, this is amazing. And it's not pretending that the trial doesn't exist either. He means put into perspective the reality that God is near and He is working in you. And for a lot of us, we already know this. We have a knowing that faithfulness to God is a great comfort to our souls, right? And in the times of unfaithfulness, we know how much it torments our souls. So number one, realize that your faith is a growing thing. It's maturing and growing up in the Lord. It needs to mature and grow up. And consider this to be your great joy. Five to eight. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. You know, wisdom, godly wisdom, is being able to discern between right and wrong, wrong conduct in the eyes of the Lord. That's what a godly wisdom is. But it's more than that. Wisdom is also being able to live out that right action. Jesus would say, wisdom, it's proved right by her deeds. It's knowing God's perspective on the situation and living according to it. People can become wise in all sorts of ways. You can, you can go through that through academics. You can be kind of street smart, know the social skills. You can be wise with your words to get where you need to be. You can be wise with your finances and so on and so forth. But to be wise in the eyes of God, to be able to discern the things of God as good and evil and know his perspective, that knowledge comes from above. That knowledge comes from him. The reason that the fear of the Lord, Proverbs would say, the reason that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom is because the wisest way one can live is pleasing to God. The foolish way to live is to not care and therefore to have no fear of the Lord. Now, God knows that when we come to faith, we're babies. We're babies, and that's okay. We all start where we're at. That's where we start. But we're not to remain babies. I have a little baby myself, and I watch her jam TV remotes and everything else under the sun into her mouth, and she's trying to figure out what can I eat and what can I not eat. She touches everything in the house. What am I allowed to go into and what am I not allowed to go into? She's figuring that out. And I'm teaching her at the same time. Yep, don't put that in your mouth. That's a mouse trap and I'm giving her and I'm teaching her as she is learning as well. And so if you're trying to act in faithfulness to God in your life, God loves that. He truly loves that you think, how do I live out this circumstance pleasing to my father? Of course he enjoys that. But if you're living and you're thinking, do I know if I'm doing the right thing or not? Ask him. James says, ask. Ask and he will generously give to you. And the reason is because we need his discernment on how to live. You don't need an opinion. You need God's wisdom. And the beauty of asking God, James will say, is it will be given. Have you ever looked through scripture? Those who ask, they will receive. Jesus will say, those who ask for the Holy Spirit, they will receive the Holy Spirit. You might have asked for many things in your life from the Father. You might have asked for a good life. You might have asked for, I don't know, an attractive partner. You might have asked for a fulfilling job and so on and so forth. And God can give those things and he loves to bless in those ways. 
but have you asked according to his promises? The things that he says, if you ask, I will give it to you. Ask for wisdom and he will give you wisdom. He is willing if you're willing to ask. You see, God can grow immature faith and he can make it wise and he can make it complete in him. However, he does not grow disbelief. He does not grow doubt and he does not foster it. James teaches us how you must ask for wisdom. You must believe and not doubt. In other words, you must trust God that he can fulfill his word. Trust that God can fulfill his promises. To disbelieve God is able is to disbelieve in the very character and nature of God. God is happy to foster and nurture faith that is struggling, feeble, and weak. And he'll give abundantly and generously to it. But to ask of God and just blow hot air and think, "Mm, God's not really going to do anything about this. Why should anyone expect to receive anything in that circumstance? That God is not able to do it. James will say this person's like a wave. It's a can consistent inconsistency you're no particular direction you're double-minded he will say you're following God one day and then oh whoops there's a new there's a new teaching that comes in so I'll just follow that one now you're this way you're that way but God's character is not like this God's not depicted as a wave God's depicted as a rock trustworthy dependable reliable why because he fulfills that which he says he will fulfill his character is true you can pray and ask according to his promises and you will receive according to his promises believe as faithful christians living away from home well first of all you just need to pray that's not something you're doing that is something that you should be doing by faith but you need God's discernment on how to live. Pray for his wisdom. He will give according to his promises. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Here's the true hashtag blessed life. When we look at the world through our our normal eyes, it's easy to see who we call blessed or or lucky, I guess, in in one sense, and, and who we call cursed. It's those who life just looks like it favors them. It just goes well for them. And we're like, geez, that guy's lucky. And yet on the flip side, the one that it just doesn't seem to go for, we normally just say, well, that one's unlucky. It's life kind of just favoring that person. But the wisdom of God discerns blessedness and cursed or lucky or unlucky in a different way. And it starts with, James will start with, a believer in humble circumstances. He is talking about, firstly, someone that believes in Christ by faith, and secondly, someone who is poor. Poor either financially or they're poor in their social status. They mean nothing really in the world. They're kind of the despised and the rejected. And James encourages them. And he says to them, boast and glory that by faith God has elevated you to receive the riches of the kingdom of heaven it's not a boasting in poverty where to help those in poverty it's a boasting that God has favored them rejoice in that their social standing the way that the world views them is no revelation of how God views them it is quite different The first shall be last, the last shall be first, Jesus would say. Who we consider small, God considers great. Jesus says, blessed are you, the poor, for yours is the kingdom. The poor, the destitute, the downtrodden in the world, they are rich in faith and ready to receive the kingdom of God more easily than us who are rich because they get the fundamental reality of the gospel message. They're unworthy. 
And God's grace has brought them in to receive the kingdom of God. But it's not like this for the rich. The rich should take pride in their humiliation. This could mean two things. James could be talking about rich people in general, the believer and the unbeliever. Or he could be talking specifically to rich believers. Now, if it's talking about both the believer and the unbeliever who are rich, then this section about humiliation really, and all the imagery that follows, is really just about the idea, be humbled by the fact that though you are rich, death is a great equalizer. Your riches, your social standing, and all that you have in life is fleeting. Humble, be humble in the fact that death is coming. I personally don't view it this way, and I'm going to tell you why I don't view it this way. I think it has some merit, but I don't see it this way. I believe Scripture here is speaking specifically to rich believers on a much deeper level. And I say this because, firstly, as we saw in the intro, James is writing this to teach Christians how to live by faith. Secondly, there would be rich Christians in the church amongst the poor as well that needed to know and understand their earthly position in light of God. Not in light of death, in light of God. And that's really my third point, is God's, godly wisdom isn't just saying, hey, you know what, you can't take it with you when you go. Everyone knows that. We all figured that out. Yep, none of this stuff here really helps me in anything if there's an afterlife. What the believer wants to know, that the unbeliever doesn't care about, in the wisdom of God. Does my riches and my title and my position in life have any worth before God? Not before death, before God. And it's godly wisdom to understand that you are not favored by God because your life is great. You are not favored by God because you're rich. You're not favored by God because other people favor you. You're not favored by God because you're somehow superior, more special than those around you. The rich and the poor are receiving the kingdom of God the same way. By faith in Christ, his blood shed upon the cross for you. They are receiving it. For the poor, they sit there and they scream, hallelujah and glory be to God that you would even look at someone such as myself and favor me and lift me up. And for the rich, they have to humble themselves before God and say, nothing that I am is worthy of you. And I am so thankful that a gracious God would look upon an unworthy sinner such as myself. And so they should take pride in their humiliation. That is truly godly wisdom. You see, so many people think in this world, that to attain to this reaping or reward of eternal life, it's going to be based upon who they are or what they've done. Who they are, I'm not like the rest, there's something different and God's got it. What they've done, look at the way that I live, surely this is deserving, surely this is deserving of the kingdom. But it's not on the basis of that. Verse 12 tells us plainly that faithfulness is. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Perseveres in what? Faith under trial. Why is this person blessed? Because their faith is receiving the crown of life. The crown of life that is here, this isn't a royal crown like a king or a queen. This is a wreath, like an Olympian. Someone that has run the race and has finished. Someone that has persevered and made it to the end. Someone that has remained faithful to God. And the promise of eternal life is theirs in Him. The faithful are blessed. Don't let the trial steal it away. Verse 12 has one other fundamental characteristic that hasn't been spoken out in James the whole time, and it's the most fundamental characteristic of Christianity. That's love. It is not strict faith of obedience to God's word, worked out by fear of damnation that gives salvation. It is the love of God known through the revelation of Jesus Christ that compels his people to love him, and they work it out through faithful obedience to his word. 
It's love that compels. It's love that drives. God first loved us, and we are compelled by that love to be faithful to Him. He is our great joy. He is our great pleasure. Love for God is expressed through obedience to His Word. Christ will say this from John 13 all the way through. Faith needs to be maturing amidst the trials. It needs to grow. It's going to take godly wisdom to be able to discern how to live by faith in this world. And you need to be able to distinguish what a blessed life looks like. We all have to live by faith in this world. The Word of God seeded is producing the fruits of this creation. And if you're not willing to live by faith through the trials in this world, you're not going to grow. And as I said with Jesus and the sower, the faith will die. The purpose of the seed of God's Word planted in you, Jesus says, is that it might yield fruit. That's how the parable ends. It's planted in you so that it might yield and produce. There's two reasons that fruit is yielded on a tree. To reproduce what it was produced from and to enjoy what it gives. That's what it's there for. Faith is grown from the Word of God. Faith produces itself so that more fruit might come. And this fruit is pleasing to the Father. He delights in this. And so to end my time here, I want to walk you back to my mulberry tree in my backyard. Big stretched out bit of lawn, red dirt all around it, and this big mulberry tree sitting at the end. Once you imagine I've walked you over to it, you're sitting with me on the lawn, I'm like, look how big and beautiful this tree is. You're looking up again, sun shimmering on the leaves. And you're like, yeah, in comparison to all other mulberry trees, this one's by far the coolest. You walk towards it, still amazed by all its grandeur. And as you draw near, you finally see why it's so big and so beautiful in my back lawn. It's a fruitless mulberry. It doesn't know the first thing about the hardship of trying to produce. It's just big and fancy. And I fear that many of us are like this tree. We're happy to say that we believe. But if there is going to be the first trial or the first problem that interferes because I believe in Christ, then I would rather just be comfortable in the world. Looks great, but it's got nothing. If you're going to live your life for Christ... You must live by faith in the Word of God and know with a great, a great comfort that you who entrust, you who you entrust your life to, He is faithful. He's a rock, dependable, trustworthy. He is faithful. He will be with you in the trial and by faith, He will lead you to life forevermore with Him. That's the promise of God. Persevere. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the direction that your, your servant James gives us. Lord, we want to be real about the, the world that we live in and the reality that we live in. And Father, help our hearts to seek you above all else be faithful to you above all else. Lord, would you restore unto us the joy of our salvation? Renew our spirits, Lord, that you would be the greatest joy, that you would be the greatest pleasure in our lives. Father, if we have gone astray, Lord, or if we've just kind of gone into autopilot, Father, forgive us and lead us back to you. Father, I thank you that you love us, that you are gracious to us, and you are always calling us. Lord, help us to walk in faith to you. In your name I pray. Amen.